gun prohibition groups like uh, Bloomberg and Giffords and if the their smaller but older groups like Brady have been working for as long as they've been around to make sure that every gun gets registered because this is something that they agree with with the the uh, pro second amendment people is as a practical matter gun registration makes gun confiscation much easier <laughs> If you're a gun owner in Colorado, this was not a good year for you. Matter of fact, the last couple of years haven't been good years for you. If you're emotional about gun control, maybe you feel better about it. Dave Kopel with the Second Amendment Project at the Independence Institute, one of the nation's best legal experts on the Second Amendment. How do you rate this year's, what was it, about four gun bills that made it through the Well, the we got four that made it through and two more that may yet make it over the finish line. By the time this airs, we'll know if they, right. they made it or not. Let's talk about the four that we know were signed into law yes. by, by the governor. Um, all bad, could have been much worse. Oh, so we got nothing to worry about. <laughs> now it gives, gives the, the gun ban people something to do next year and the year after that. Let's, let's talk about them. Let's, let's do them in order. Raising the age to 21. Um, I hate these kind of laws. I hate it when they did it with drinking. I hate it when they do it with anything. There's this middle age of 18 to 20 when you're an adult, but not an adult. And it's these three years of, of what the hell are you? So uh, you can live on your own, but you can't defend yourself now and you can't get a gun. It seems like, uh, I understand the idea. It just seems like there are going to be a lot of women out there who won't be able to defend themselves. Weigh in on this for me. Well, sure. So let, let's say you are, uh, you're 18 years old and you, you live in Missouri and then you, you move to Colorado because you want to work here in the uh, ski industry or, or go to school here or whatever, and you get your own apartment. By Colorado law, not until 21 can you buy any type of firearm to defend yourself, even just to keep in your own apartment. That's that. That's that. The only way you could get a firearm would be like if your family back in Missouri has a firearm, but they have to give that to you before you move to Colorado because you can't do interstate uh, firearms transfers. Can, can they bring it out to you on Christmas and give it to you to help protect yourself? No, because that's interstate. That would be a, a federal law problem. So in other words, an 18 year old girl living alone can be unprotected until she's 21. Right. That's part of the point of the bill. That's one of the ways they will reduce gun violence as they call it, because they believe gun violence, as they call it, includes all forms of somebody getting shot with a gun, you know, suicide, criminal acts, accidents, and self-defense to the, the, the gun prevention lobby. All of those, they count in their statistics about this is the gun violence we have to get rid of. The shooting mm -hmm. at East High School was done by somebody who was under 21. This law would have prevented that. Well, it was done with a handgun. And so theoretically, that should have been prevented ever since the Federal Gun Control Act of 1968, which says you can't buy a handgun from a licensed retailer if you're under 21. So, and, and, and Colorado has, in, uh, and Colorado further says with our background check law from 2013, it actually said you can only buy guns if you root the transaction, even if you're buying them for your f friend from the last 40 years who lives next door, you still to do that sale or even a loan, you have to root that f through a federal firearms licensee, a gun store. And since the person's under 21, the gun store can't deliver a firearm under any circumstances to someone under 21. So in other words, this wouldn't have made any difference? Well, no, not this bill. They, they have a, a bill to ban the home manufacturer of firearms. All right, let's talk about which that they one. say would have prevented that. And I love this. The, the Anti-gunners are so good when it comes to the imaging of how, how they sell what they're doing. Yeah. Assault weapon being one of the yeah. all-time greats. You know, it's, it's such a great pornography term, which is, I know it when I see it, 
But when you ask right. for a definition, they can't really define it. They come up with things like folding stocks and magazine length, when in fact, the machine is no different than any other hunting rifle that's a semi-automatic with a detachable magazine. It's not, it's, it's, a, it's a made up name. Ghost gun, when I heard the, the word for the first time coming out of our president's mouth when he was running for president, I was like, what in the world is a ghost gun? So the idea that people manufacture their own guns has been going on for as long as, as there have been guns. So what what is what does the ghost gun ban do? The ghost what they call a ghost gun ban is a ban on manufacturing your own firearm at home, which is something Americans have been doing uh, since the very first days when the Virginia colony was established in 1607. Uh, firearms manufacture at the time was artisanal. Uh, a gun maker would would typically make one gun at a time. Now, if you wanted a gun made, you know, it would probably be the, the village blacksmith who might have the, the basic knowledge to do it. But certainly anybody who had the tools uh, could make or repair their own guns. And actually, in the, in the American Revolution, that became very important. Of course, there was a, a British arms embargo against the Americans. The Americans were trying to smuggle in guns from uh, the Dutch Republic, from France, and from Spain. Uh, but they were also trying to make as many of the, their own as they could. And so the, the uh, U.S. government and state governments uh, strongly encouraged that. I think I heard it was Chris Hansen, one of the state legislators, who said we need to stop this because you can just buy all the parts and put together a gun in three minutes. I will give Chris Hansen every penny I have if, if he can do that, if he can just order all the parts and put together a gun. It's those kind of lies, and they are lies. He's a smart yeah. guy. There is no way to do that well, because there, a frame- there's a, there's a difference between being smart and being well-informed. But he's a lawmaker. He should <laughs> know the difference between a gun that is disassembled and a gun that has to be manufactured. There, the idea of getting, you can't buy a 100% made gun frame. If you're doing that, you are purchasing a gun and you have right. to get through an FFL, Federal Firearms Licensed Dealer. Otherwise, you're buying a gun. If not, if he, can, if he can manufacture, if he can manufacture a gun in three minutes, then my God, he is something special. And well, I will give him every penny I own to see him do that. Well, even if you had a gun that was, every part was completely manufactured and finished, you couldn't put together a firearm in three minutes. No. I mean, the, the intricacy of the, the parts like the trigger and the springs, and, and how that fits to the hammer and all that. No, I mean, I mean that, that, that takes I've, a while I've to do. I've taken apart a Glock. I've put it back together. It, it, is, it is not an easy thing to do. And the Glock is known for being one of the simplest firearms and the easiest to take apart and, and reassemble. All right, so what does this, this ghost gun silliness do? It says no manufacturing of firearms by an individual who's not a licensed firearms dealer. And what are those people who, and there are, I would imagine tens if not hundreds of thousands in Colorado that already have such guns who will never turn them in or have them registered. Well, they're, they're given the option of by the end of uh, 2023 to go to a firearms licensed dealer and pay the dealer to engrave a unique serial number on the firearm. And of course the, de the dealer would have to go through all the dealer's paperwork, which is filling out registration records on that gun. You know, the reason and, and actually the, the dealer would then have to charge you uh, a background check to give the gun fee, to give the gun back to the individual. And by our three day waiting period, uh, <laughs> you'd also have to wait three days after the dealer's finished engraving it uh, for the gun to be returned. And why people don't understand this, a lot of people make their own guns for the sole purpose of making sure the government doesn't know it exists that when they come knocking for it, it's not there. Well, there, there's the rub, and that's, that's the great divide. The gun prohibition groups like uh, Bloomberg and Giffords, and if the, their smaller but older groups like Brady, have been working for as long as they've been around to make sure that every gun gets registered. Because 
this is something that they agree with, with the, the uh, pro-Second Amendment people, is as a practical matter, gun registration makes gun confiscation much easier. That's really the point of the background checks on private sales, is not that you're going to stop so many criminals, but if you say, you know, if, if you sold a gun uh, to, to some me. guy who's been your... Well, no, no, I'd be responsible. No, but all I'd, right, it's a responsible person. <laughs> if, I, if, if you sold a gun to some guy who's been your friend for 25 years, it's not so much that they really think your friend is an incipient criminal who they want a background check, but it's more like they want to make sure that gun, which may not be currently registered, goes through a federal firearms dealer who has to keep paperwork records that then get, and these days electronic records, that then get scooped up by the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives and are used to create the National Registry of Firearms. Are they now electronic? Uh, gun dealers, overwhelmingly, yeah. Okay, because I mean, it used to be they the, fill no, you, a piece of paper the, and... The, the dealer, the, dealer, the uh, buyer has to do the, the on paper Federal Form 4473 where he uh, or she attests to address race as if that mattered. Hispanic or not, as if that, that matters, matters. Uh, and and so on, and and also affirms that the buyer is not prohibited by being a convicted felon or doing drugs, including marijuana. Right, all all those things. So that's still on paper, but the dealer records are are often kept electronically these days. And when that dealer retires, the federal government the, the federal government takes them all, and therefore they become government records. And why is it why is it that we gun owners worry so much about registered guns? Because gun registration is often used for gun confiscation. And, you know, you can look at historical examples like uh, France and Germany after the Nazis took over, or you can look at examples in democratic countries like in England and Australia, where the American gun ban lobbies and, and President Obama and Secretary of State Clinton both touted the British and Australia gun confiscations as examples that the United States should follow. Well, gun registration helped a lot on that, and it helps in the United States. Like when Michael Bloomberg was mayor of New York City, he added to New York City gun confiscation, and, and uh, it might have even started with Giuliani, that some guns you own, like a six-shot hunting rifle, uh, which you have to have registered in New York City ever since 1967. You can keep the gun, but once you die, that's it. The gun has to be surrendered to the government. Or you can, you can take it out of state, but you could never, like, give it to your son who lives in, in uh, Utica, New York, or, or any, anybody else in New York. It, it either gets surrendered to the government or taken out of state. Incredible. Hey, let's get to these other bills as well. The one that confused me so much is the lawsuit bill. Yeah. You know, there's a federal law that prohibits a death by a thousand cuts to gun manufacturers and, yeah. and others. So now there's a law in Colorado that says I can sue, uh, I can sue gun manufacturers and I can sue retailers who sell guns and gun supplies and holsters and all sorts of things. Explain this one to me, because this one seems to be a can of worms that could really, really destroy a lot of businesses, well, small that, businesses as well. <laughs> you Am I could, misreading you it? You call that a problem. It's the benefit from the other point of view. <laughs> the, right, you're right. The, the 2005 federal law, the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act, called PLACA for short, um, and parallel Colorado laws enacted in uh, 1985 and then strengthened in 2001, basically say if somebody commits a crime with a gun, you can't sue the manufacturer of the firearm and nor can you sue the retailer of the firearm, provided that all along the way they complied with all the relevant gun control laws. Like the, the, the retailer properly took down the registration forms, called for a background check, all, all those things. That somebody in the firearms business who rigorously complies with all the laws uh, can't be sued. If I have a gun that is manufactured improperly, blows up in my face, and injures me, 
Yeah. I can still sue the manufacturer of the gun. It was a faulty gun, Th- right? Yes, that's a manufacturing defect. Okay. Absolutely. You can, you can sue but for if, that. But if somebody shoots me with that gun, the idea is it's not the gun manufacturer's fault that he acted as a criminal or the guy who sold him the gun, assuming he did so lawfully. Yeah. But now I can sue both of these these entities right, in Colorado. The, right, the, the same way you'd be able, as if you could say, sue Ford uh, because some drunk driver hit you with a Ford vehicle. Ford has a lot of money. The mom and pop store doesn't. And even yeah. these gun manufacturers, I think people think they're like big tobacco. Right. Are they? No, if you, if you put all the gun manufacturers in the United States together, you still wouldn't have a Fortune 500 company. They're machine shops. They're really, they're not, they're not, they're not big operations. They are really machine shops. Well, they, yes. am, I, am I wrong? Well, they're, they're bigger than, uh, some guy's garage machine shop. They're, right. they're vastly bigger than that. But they're, when you think about American really large business, like the fortune 500, it's not, it's not, it's not a Ford factory. It's not, a factory, yeah. but it's not, you know, I, I think of Ruger, which is one of the largest yes. gun manufacturers in the country. Yeah. And it's still not, it's, it's, it doesn't take up acres and acres and acres and acres. You know, there's no right. smokestacks. Right. Um, it, it, it's still a pretty small metalworks shop. Well, and, and that's why the gun ban lobbies in the late 1980s, with the cooperation of President Clinton's then Secretary of State, Andrew Cuomo, then as now the conscience of our nation, uh, put together a plan to work with local governments to sue the handgun manufacturers all over the United States. So they brought about three dozen different cases all over the country with big city mayors or uh, at the Cuomo suggestion, local housing authorities getting involved. And the point of this was to uh, destroy the the handgun manufacturers by uh, sticking them with exorbitant litigation costs. You know, 36 cases at once is a lot to defend. You know, if you're 40, you can handle that, but not, not if you're a normal, medium-sized American business. And the, the plaintiff's lawyers in this were people who had uh, made huge amounts of money by ultimately successful suits against big tobacco, said so very, very out front. You know, that yeah, that, that's why we're structuring the suits the way they are. Let me see if I'm hearing you correctly. So the lawyers had the money, and they structured the suits, not necessarily to win, but to make sure that the legal costs crippled the gun manufacturers out of business. Right. Were they ever successful? They came pretty close because they, at the time, as a uh, Smith & Wesson, you know, one of the most one venerable of the companies, yeah, yeah, was owned by a British conglomerate. And the British conglomerate told, ordered them to settle. Well. Part of the settlement terms... Just like the British. Yeah. They never liked us having guns. <laughs> right. This is true. Uh, one of the uh, terms of the settlement was not only, you know, you have to do business in the following ways. You know, you, you can't sell magazines over 10 rounds, things like that. You also have to remove shareholder control of the company. And you can keep them as nominally in control, but the business is actually going to be run by a five-member committee, of which the five mem- of, of the five members, four are appointed to be anti-gun, and one is from some representative of the industry. That's beautiful. Well, and, Smith- that's, and that's why the federal law came into existence. To and Smith and Wesson ultimately, even though they entered into the agreement, it, it ultimately never went into effect. Because, and then the federal government came in and said, all right, we see what you're trying to do. You're trying yeah. to put an industry out of business. And a lot of gun manufacturers, even though there are a couple big ones, there's Smith & Wesson, there's Ruger, and you can go down a few, six yeah. hour, and there's some hefty, yeah. but they're still small. And then there's a sea of, of smaller manufacturers that wouldn't survive even one nuisance lawsuit. And there's every gun shop in Colorado wouldn't survive even one nuisance lawsuit. And so the idea is we're just going to nuisance them out of business. Yes, and uh, partly by claiming that they are a public nuisance because they sell too many guns, for example, or they sell the kinds of guns which the Colorado legislature 
has said, oh, don't sell these guns. You can sell these guns. So the store complies with what the Colorado legislature says. And now the new law allows plaintiffs, which is to say lawyers for the billionaire gun ban lobbies, to turn around and sue the small store that did everything right in complying with Colorado law. The fourth bill, help me out on the fourth bill that the governor signed into law. So we've got age, we've got ghost guns, we've got- That's not, that's not signed as of uh, the moment we're taping. Okay, which is? So let, let's see, we got- There were four, we, there were four. We, we, we're, we're, age, we're, waiting period, lawsuits. We should never have two guys with Alzheimer's drinking bourbon trying to figure this one yeah. out. We'll just continue. Why didn't the assault weapon bill pass? I'm still not convinced it's not going to get reintroduced somehow. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, 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 it's not impossible. But uh, Governor Polis made it fairly clear he didn't want that bill. And the price the gun ban lobbies extracted for that was lots of other bills. You know, I mean, they're, they're, and they're uh, strategic enough to take lots of things, even if they can't have, if, and to say, okay, we you really don't want that. Um, we won't make a huge, we won't insist that you sign this one. But he signed the law that ended preemption. Yes. Which has opened up the floodgates to every, every anti-gun city or every anti-gun city council, I should right. say, passing a whole bunch of laws, making everyone a criminal without their knowledge. Um, saying that, well, if you have a 10-round magazine, now you're illegal. If you have a gun that has a folding stock, now you're illegal. Because it's not guns that kill people. It's pistol grips that kill people. Yes. You know, it's not guns that kill people. It's a stock that can go like this that kill people. Or it's a stock that you can, so you can adjust the gun's length from 31 inches to 34 inches. So you've got a tall husband and a short wife, and they can share the same gun, and, and it can fit each of when, them when they use that. And that is supposedly something that makes a gun a super powerful weapon of war. Or something that is a, has a pistol grip, which makes it so a shooter is a more accurate target shooter. Right. So you, you, you have a wood stock and you go, this is good, I can shoot. But if I switch out this wood stock for a polymer stock that has a, a, a pistol grip, oh, now when I shoot a competition, I have better control of this gun. Well, now you're a criminal. This is just... It is remarkably insane stuff, but it's governed by people's fear and people's passions. And I say this because, as you know, I used to be that guy. I used to be an anti-gunny. I used to give money to these groups. And it took a lot for me to get over my irrational fears of this. And it's really hard to do so. It takes a long time to face your fears and go, I have to look through these and I have to look at the guns and I have to go through the guns and I have to go through the statistics and I have to demystify it because these guns, when you're a gun phobe, they're not guns, they're swastikas. They're religious artifacts. They have souls and, and well, they're, they're, free will. And they're, they're objects of, of hate and, right. and moral panic, as are the people who own them. And the idea of like knowing about guns and understanding them when you're writing gun control bills, I mean, that, that from the point of view of some of them, I mean, that's like saying, you know, we're, we're going to outlaw satanic ritual abuse. Oh, well, to do that, you need to like actually find out what the Satanists do and, you know, their particular rituals and, you know, where the, you know, what kind of animal blood they, they smear on statues of the Virgin Mary and things like that. And we don't want to know that kind of stuff. Um, so they just let the lobbyists write the bills, and the lobbyists also don't know much about guns, but they know enough to write them in very inclusive uh, ways. In 2013, which is hard to believe it's been a decade yeah, now, yeah. and both you and I look just as young as we did a decade ago, when we were fighting some really bad bills, again, with great intent, they took away 30-round magazines, they took away all magazines, and limited guns to 15 rounds. Um, or magazine limits right. to 15 yeah. rounds. And they said, as they always do, we're not limiting guns. We're not taking away any choices. Yeah, You can still have all the guns you want. We're just saying you can have gun magazines with more than 15 rounds. I keep an informal list 
of all the guns that are now illegal in Colorado because many manufacturers have guns that only have 16 round, 17 round, sometimes 18 round magazines, and the manufacturers don't make 15 round or less uh, substitutes. And every year, there is a new batch of terrific guns. If you want a uh, a Springfield XD, that is a 17 round magazine. That's that's what it comes with. There's no 15 round that the manufacturer gets. And I'm not trusting my life to some um, off-brand aftermarket aftermarket, uh, made up one. So they did. The, The state legislature outlawed that gun. You can still get the gun, which is useless because when you buy it, the the guy has to go. Well, you can't have this. Here you go. Yeah. You know, here's here's your new toy. You can never put a battery in it. Um, and well, that's the same argument that's being used in court today. Like there are other states where there are magazine bans, and the gun ban lobbies and their allied attorney generals defending these laws will say, "Oh, we completely respect the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms." An arm is a firearm. A magazine is not a firearm. You know, the Second Amendment doesn't have anything to do with these accessories you put on a gun, like, you know, saying, like, a, like a scope or something like that. It's like saying, we respect your right to have a gun, just not a firing pin. You know, right. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's the same thing. What else in the waning days of the session do you think might happen on, on guns? Is there something else out there that is still being weighed on? Besides the fourth bill that you and I cannot remember. There's the bill to allow, give counties greater mm. scope in banning firearms use on one's private property. And the real reason for this comes down to basically, as, as I, according to the reports in the Clear, Clear Creek Courant, one bad guy who lives sort of outside Idaho Springs on maybe a third of an acre and is shooting off his guns all the time. And it, you know, it's safe in the sense that the bullets aren't exiting his property. But it's a constant hassle of noise pollution for all the people nearby. So to deal with this one bad guy, they want to change the law to broadly allow counties to prohibit uh, shooting in, in, on all kinds of private land. I remembered it. You know, if only somebody gave me a waiting period before I served up this drink, we would have remembered what that last bill was, which is that if somebody wants to have access to their constitutional rights, they should wait three days before they have it. So if you're going to have the right to free free speech, you should have uh, the right to it but you should wait three days to cool down before you say what you need to say. So now in Colorado, yeah. you can buy a gun, but you have to wait three days. Before three you days have it. minimum. Localities can lengthen that as much as they want. As, how much? Uh, um, as in the American Express card, there is no preset limit. Seriously. So in anti-gun Boulder, where I'm now a criminal again, uh, uh, where we live, they could say a decade? They could say, look, in Australia, there's, it's 28 days. And so a woman who's dealing with a stalker or a raging boyfriend who's not respecting a restraining order, um, so if she's 20 years old, she can't get a gun. Uh, she's 21 and can finally get a gun. She might have to wait as long as city council of Boulder decides she has to wait. That is true. And so or at least three days. Well, at least three days statewide, no matter what, and then whatever the locality wants to layer onto that. In the, uh, in the Senate, as I was listening to the testimony, uh, one of the senators, Republican senators, brought up a personal situation that occurred when, when he was living in another state. And his family was being stalked. And in fact, the stalker broke into the home, did some vandalism and other mischief in it, and then, then left while there was nobody there. They called the police, and the police officer said, you know, you might think about getting a gun, which the, the senator then did at that point. And the senator asked uh, the sponsor, and I, I believe it was Chris Hansen, you know, well, what about that kind of situation? And Hansen basically completely blew it off and said, well, we're following the science here. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> the science of what? <sighs> the science is if you can, well, here's the supposed science they've got. There's a, uh, it's, well, <laughs> science. To, to be precise, the science is the PNAS study. Could you please be very careful and, <laughs> and repeat that? Uh, PNAS, P-N-A-S, is the uh, abbreviation for a scientific, the full name of a scientific journal, but it's, it's called okay. PNAS. Um, there was a study some Harvard business professors wrote in that where they said in states that have waiting periods, handgun homicide is 17% lower than in states that don't. And they actually, they won't cite the study, but they, the, that study is referenced uh, without its name in, in the actual bill that Governor Polis signed. That's what they mean by listening to the science. So now, if that's true, that would be a fairly easy thing to check because you'd say, okay, well, in Colorado, we don't have a waiting period. And if we did, then gun homicides would be 17% lower. Handgun homicides would be 17% lower. So therefore, that means that 17%, about one out of six homicides, are perpetrated with a gun that was acquired within the, the se within several recent days. Right. Three days or seven days or something like that. And that would be very easy to verify. You just look at the guns used in homicides and go, was this gun purchased or uh, received within yeah. three days, seven days, 10 right. days? It was, it was bought on Monday and used in a crime on Saturday night. Right. That would support it if it was bought on Monday and used in a crime seven years later. That would not be an example. Right. And again, that would be simple math. And that would also be the, be the science. That would be the has, science, right. And of course, that's not the case. It's preposterous. And as I told the committee, looking Senator Tom Sullivan in the eye, you know it's false. Just ask any cop, any police chief, any sheriff. It's not even remotely close to true. The closest statistics we have on that are the FBI's uh, crime traces, uh, crime gun traces, or, or sometimes they trace other guns too. But anyway, their shortest period of you know, time to crime, from the time it's per the gun is purchased till the time ATF asks for a trace, they're looking at things like 90 days and the percentage is well under 17%. Is there any science about how many people have been hurt or a victim of a crime because they have not been able to defend themselves because they weren't able to get a gun? No, there, there's no, uh, no I data. I Gary Kleck did some of that or? No, Gary um, Kleck, he's a Florida State University uh, emeritus professor now. Who am I thinking of? On, More guns, less crime. That's John Lott. John Lott. All, all those things are, like the PNAS study, are inferential of trying to look at, at broad statistical totals and, and make inferences about crimes. What you're talking about is the actual data of, you know, this incident and this incident and this incident. And those exist only in, um, in an, at an anecdotal level in, in either direction. Talk to me a little bit about red flags, because there was some expansion oh, that was, that's of the red another flag. One, yes. That was, no, that was another one of the four that the governor signed. Now we're up to five, but keep going. Um, yeah, but we're not counting ghost guns and, and, and county uh, firing limits right. in the five um, or six. Um, Let's keep drinking. <laughs> the, the red flag, so the red flag bill did two things. First of all, it actually repealed the entire existing red flag law and reenacted it because there's ongoing litigation in the Colorado appellate courts of the fact that when the bill was being passed the first time and one of the Republican representatives requested, as the Constitution allows, to say, I would like the bill to be read at length. The Colorado Constitution specifies that it takes three days to pass a bill in each chamber, and that is the day of first reading, the day of second reading, and the day of third reading. You can't, you can't do a bill in less than three days per chamber. And on second and third reading, the bill shall be read at length unless there's unanimous consent to waive reading. Right. So a Republican legislator asked for reading at length in the House on, I believe, second reading on the red flag bill. The Democratic leadership said, sorry, we're too busy on that, um, and, and didn't do it, which has led to a lawsuit. 
and it, it's in the appellate courts That's now. That's brilliant. And so, well, well, so now this time repealing it and replacing it is brilliant. Yeah, because that that get, gets rid of the problem on the original enactment. So they they did that. That actually is a common sense gun control law um, in, that they wanted to make it have an effect, and they uh, undid the error that they'd done in the previous session. On top of that, they expanded the number of people who can ask for a, a red flag gun confiscation order to be issued by a court before the subject of the order has an opportunity to, to appear and tell her side of the story. And the, the major expansions were uh, education professionals and healthcare professionals. So does that mean if, if someone someone's a healthcare professional and wants to get even with uh, with a girlfriend, they can make a false accusation and get the woman disarmed before before she has a chance to tell a judge, no, this is not right? Well, if, if you've got the, they didn't need that bill to do that. If, you, right. if you're someone for whom there was a dating relationship yeah. that existed under the original red flag law, you could already do and, and you know, write the poison pen letter and get is, the gun confiscation. Let me, let me ask you this one. Because you know, the idea of a red flag law, I hate the name, but the idea of saying, listen, there's, there's, there's this guy and he's off his nut. Yeah. And I know he's got guns and I know he's a danger. I think about the Aurora Theater shooter and the, the shrink who was working with him going to the, pol the police but she didn't. Uh, well, she talked. She talked to. Um, um, she talked to the supervisor. They did go to. You can talk to George Brockler about it. It's actually pretty fascinating. But, but the fact that there there was a warning there, and it didn't work out the way it should. I like the idea that if there is something out there that you can go, hey, there's there's something here. This guy could be a danger. Is there a red flag? law that could work that would that would meet your test oh has sure it, has any place done it um i think the governor of tennessee uh may be proposing something like that in a special session of the legislature this summer but not for what's been enacted no i mean i've testified repeatedly in the colorado legislature and twice in the u.s senate judiciary committee on this and, and talking about how to do a red flag law with proper due process and what it should be in my view is that Anybody can raise a concern. You know, you don't need some special relationship or whatever. It could be just like you said, the guy down My the street. My roommate is nuts, and he's talking crazy. He's got a gun. I think he could hurt somebody. Right, or even the guy who lives in the apartment uh, two doors down, who I've got no relationship with, he's also equally crazy. Go to a law enforcement officer, uh, a police officer's or a district attorney. That's what the Connecticut law says is you go, anybody can raise the issue, go to a law enforcement officer, the law enforcement officer has to do an independent investigation, and then the law enforcement officer can file for the gun confiscation order. That sounds pretty simple. And that's what George Brockler would, would favor as well. But what the anti-gun lobbies want, they don't want the filter of law enforcement making the decision about confiscation. They want as many people as possible and they always keep expanding who can do it to be able to come in on their own, not even appear in court, just file an affidavit, never be cross-examined, be able to and and never give the the and don't give the target an opportunity to tell his side of the story. So let, let me see first. if I'm following you right, because I want I want to make sure I've got this. Really all you're looking for is that anybody can say, hey this guy's got a gun I think he's whacked out. I think he's a danger. Anybody can do that, but they've got to go to somebody who has to go through due process. That, that's a cop. That's a DA. And they have to go through the legal channel. Go, to, go to a judge. Go to a judge. That judge then looks at the, the, the person who's making the claim and the person who has the gun. And that judge goes through due process. And so that person who has the gun has his moment in court goes, judge, no, that's 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 my crazy ex-wife who's been trying to get to me for years. No, I'm, I'm that's and, not and right. here's a list of the restraining orders I've got right. against the crazy ex-wife. Right, and that would be ideal. Um, I would say 
that the the norm you know, is, is say it's this person you're you're afraid is maybe may suicidal, right? But it's not like they're gonna it's it, it's not imminent, but it, it's a it, it not immediate like tomorrow, right? But it, it, it's a, a concern you have you know maybe even in the coming weeks, you should go to court, and then if the judge finds that credible, the judge can say okay we're gonna have a hearing, you know maybe tomorrow or the next day or very quickly where the other person gets to tell his side of the story, and then the judge makes the decision on the gun confiscation. I would say that when the uh, police officer or the district attorney comes into court with strong evidence that this is an immediate danger, you know, that this person might engage in an attack tomorrow, that a judge ought to be able to issue a, a temporary confiscation order with, before the other person can be heard if there's strong proof on, on right, so the immediate danger. You are much, much, much older than I am. Um, at least 15 to 28 years older than I am. And um, I remember- Yeah, but, but I gotta say, Ed, Ed, I look better for being 63 than you do for being 35. That's a good point. That's, but I've lived a better life, yeah, a harder true. life, a that rock is, and roll that, life. That is, you, you have lived the rock and roll life, absolutely. I remember as a kid, that it was people on the left who used to say things like, the ends don't justify the means. Um, and that you're innocent until proven guilty. I remember these things. I, I, I swear, they're not false memories. I swear <laughs> to God, they're not implanted memories. Uh, and that everyone has their day in court and things like this. I, I remember people for the American way and, and people and the ACLU and you know those kind of folks who, who said this stuff. And now, especially when it comes to this issue, no, the ends justify the means. And so in order to get guns away from people who might need them for their own defense, it just takes somebody to go make this claim and off they go. That really disturbs me for somebody, you're the lawyer, I'm not, who believes in the right of defense, the right of due process. And I thought that was just a shared value that even crazed anti-gunners had. Well, I think you're right about the, the times when you were growing up, like maybe when you were celebrating your, your second birthday in 1977. <laughs> um, but the, the, the difference is the, in, in Colorado for sure, and, and, and nationally, at the time the political left wing was mainly composed of liberals. Uh, liberals in the, not in the classical liberal Adam Smith sense, but liberals- Social, as, social, or should I say civil liberals, civil, civil libertarians. libertarians. As that, yeah, as that term got adopted by Franklin Roosevelt in the New Deal, and then you have people like John F. Kennedy, Hubert Humphrey, my dad, Jerry Copel, a 22-year yep. Democratic state representative. Yeah, they very much, liked almost all of the Constitution and really liked the parts in the Constitution about due process and protection for people accused of crime and so on. They, and they were also super into the First Amendment. They really loved- They loved that the you First say, Amendment. You can say whatever you want and that's your right they as an American. They came to the defense of Larry Flynn, the pornographer. And, yeah. and all kinds of people as yeah. they thought free speech was an inherently good value. The, there is some some liberalism left in some parts of the Democratic Party, more so in the rank and file I don't than, in, than in today's elected officials. Jared Polis still has some liberalism in his body. It, it, not, I'm not saying it, yeah. it, it controls but it, it all the time, but it's, well, yeah, then the gun laws would be even worse without him. Um, <laughs> no, his signature is on them. I, I, I know. I'm but sorry, I, 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 I know that Congressman Jared Polis was, I think, good on gun issues. Uh, he was good on tax issues. Governor Jared Polis has been an enemy to taxpayers. He has been an enemy to gun owners. And you can say that he's watered down what his party wants, but I expect a leader as a governor. And I expect somebody who stands up for the Constitution that he swore an oath to. Well, it, we can agree that he is reflecting how the Democratic Party at the top end of the elected officials, the people with the big money, the powerful interest groups, 
has changed from being liberal, as in the 70s and 80s, to being leftist authoritarian today. You know, the, the Jacobins, the uh, radical revolutionaries in the French Revolution who, were, uh, who popularized the guillotine, among other things, they were, they were far left, but they were not far left because they were super hardcore on we've got to protect everybody's due process rights. Yeah, you know, and that's, I guess that's the real disappointment with Jared. And you and I have known Jared. I've known Jared for, I don't know, a quarter of a century now. He ain't a, he ain't a stupid guy. He's a smart guy, he, and he knows better. And he turned from, I think, a principal guy to a, to a really good politician. And when he ended the preemption for gun laws and allowed localities to start turning good people into criminals, uh, he, he knew better. And, and that's, that was a real lack of leadership in my part, um, from my point of view. When he started using the dodge of tax increases by calling them fees, you know, instead of honoring the people of Colorado and saying, hey, I think we really need to pass this tax increase. Let me convince you why we need to pass this tax increase. Um, you know, Governor Bill Owens and I had a huge disagreement on referendum C a million years ago. We disagreed on it. We had a public disagreement on it. He won, I lost, but we, we, it was a respectful thing to go out to the people and say, here's my case. I expected that of Jared and I didn't get that. And I'm, I'm, I'm personally really disappointed in a guy I think should have, should have respected the people enough to do that. Well, and I would say every legislator, regardless of their point of view, ought to take their oath to the Constitution seriously. Then let me ask you this before you... These bills that have been passed, do you believe they are constitutional from a United States for a Second Amendment point of view? I think several of them are doubtful, given how the Supreme Court interpreted the U.S. Constitution, the Second Amendment in the June 2002 Bruin case, which was to say, hey, lower courts, remember when we did McDonald in 2010 and uh, Heller in 2008? Which your work was crucial on, by the well, way, for those who don't know. Well, thank you, and I was part of the, at, at the council table assisting the, the Heller oral argument. Um, lower courts, you should do it the way we did it, and the way we're doing it again in Bruin, which is you look at the text of the Second Amendment and its original public meaning, you know, not the secret thoughts of James Madison, but how the public at the time understood that. And then that public meaning can be uh, elucidated by the American tradition of gun laws, especially laws closer to the time of the founding, that show the meaning. So that's how you should do it. And you should not, as a judge, do your own uh, be like uh, the platonic guardian and say, oh, I'm going to weigh the benefits of this law against the harms of this law, and I'll put a few extra thumbs on the scale in favor of the legislature can do what it wants. Which laws do you believe are unconstitutional? I think, let's, let's wrap it up with, with a couple of these. I think the, the three-day waiting period has no precedent before 1900 other than licensing laws uh, for free black people, that they need a special license to get a gun, and, and that license period would obviously take several days. And I think the ban on 18 to 20 year olds buying uh, long guns um, is also lacking in uh, historical support. When cities use the lack of a preemption law to outlaw uh, so-called assault weapons and limit magazine limits to 10, are the, is that constitutional? The federal trial courts that have been dealing with these issues uh, post-Bruin have split on that issue. It'll be decided at least by the federal circuit courts of appeal. And I think based on history, no. The history in the United States uh, is if there are controversial arms in the pre-1900 period. And, that's, and Bruin says, we don't care. You, you can't have some tradition illuminating original meaning that starts in you know 1920. You think they'll um, be overturned by the US Supreme Court? Um, perhaps, but that's a use of their political capital. Although they, it's an interesting fact that this is not a ban on exotic weapons. I mean, one out yeah. of five firearms sold in the United States today is, uh, is based on the Armalite rifle model. The AR. The AR. And uh, it's obviously tr true that these are not 
guns that are only wanted by psychopaths who want to murder a lot of people to the not if one out of every five guns sold is an ar right yeah which is why it's it's turned from armalite to america's rifle yeah yeah the, the successor to the pennsylvania kentucky rifle of the got going in the 1730s and final last question um we get a lot of requests at the independence institute of where people can where women can buy especially uh the uh Dave Copel uh, calendar of, of you topless holding a lot of power tools. Where, where, do, where, do, where do people go to buy that? We did the test marketing and ultimately decided that there was no way we could get that into Target or the large department stores. So it, it's really done by a private showing by, uh, by arrangement at this point. All right. So call you. Make it, if they want to see your work on the Second Amendment and all your legal briefs, not your sadly, underwear right. briefs, but all the incredible work you've done uh, on, on the Second Amendment, where's a good place to go? My website, davecopel.org, D-A-V-E-K-O-P-E-L.org. And the calendar is on the side. Uh, the, the address for the calendar is a URL that's in an acrostic, but it's not on the homepage, so you, it'll take you a while to find it. More, more, more liquor next time. All right. Thanks. If you enjoyed that conversation, by all means, click one of these other great programs. We have the best conversations with the most fascinating Coloradans. And subscribe to our channel. Just click down below and hit that little bell button too. You don't want to miss a single show.